This video is kindly sponsored by Skillshare. Some of you may have been unfortunate enough to experience a breakdown and some of you may have even had to take your engine out, but can you imagine trying to get from A to B and having to take your engine out 10 times? A lot of you guys know that we're currently preparing to drive across the planet and so I thought it'd be a good idea to take a look back over this mammoth journey to see what went wrong and how I managed to blow up 10 engines. Believe me, I am not going to come out of this one looking good. This is not your typical video and it's unlike anything else you're going to find on YouTube. This video is focused entirely on the technical aspect of the story so it may not be your cup of tea but believe me it's still worth a watch. Now this is my opinion of what went wrong on the journey so please feel free to leave a comment below and let me know what you think. Now let's jump in the combi and get into this story. So you might be wondering First of all, why I would even buy a classic Volkswagen to do a journey like this? Well, partly it was due to nostalgia. Yes, this is me when I was a child traveling across Europe in our family combi. So there was some nostalgia going on, but more than that, I looked at a bunch of vans and the combi was actually one of the cheapest vans available in Chile at the time. Uh, I think the main reason why I opted for a Volkswagen was because I'd heard that they were easy to work on, which would definitely be coming in handy on this road trip, and that I had seen that they were used as collectivos, as shared taxis through Latin America. I was expecting the Combi to be quite a capable vehicle. Oh, maybe, might, maybe this is it. This is it. Yeah, maybe this is the one. Unfortunately, this Combi, which was named Capito, started to show signs that there might be trouble on this road trip very early on. In fact, before I even left Santiago. It's all cleared out, ready to go. But um, the tile keeps breaking down. It won't keep running at traffic lights. And just one thing after another, after another. When I bought the Combi, I was told by the family that sold it to me that it could only run for two hours and then you had to give it a break. I kind of chuckled at the time, but it turned out to be true, at least initially. I can tell you right now, if you were to embark on a journey like I did, I would recommend that you spend a lot of time making sure that that vehicle is road ready and capable of making that journey. I did not do that, but I did put in quite a bit of time fixing the electronics and changing the spark plugs and learning as much as I could from my friends in Chile at the time. It was not enough. At the family house where I was staying, the father took apart my carburetor for me and basically disassembled it and tried to show me how to put it back together. And at the time I thought, I don't need to know that. Lesson learned, if you're gonna be doing a long road trip like this, you need to be willing to learn about your own vehicle. Honestly, I made a lot of mistakes early on. I've got to put my hand up and say, I did not know what I was doing. The first one came trying to cross the Andes Mountains. We passed the, the highest mountain in the Andes between Chile and Mendoza, Argentina. It's about 22,800 feet, more or less, the highest peak. And at the time, I was under the impression that it would be a good idea to stop every little while over every summit and let the combi cool down by turning the engine off straight away. I now know through experience that the engine actually gets hotter as soon as you turn it off because it retains all of the heat and it doesn't have the fan to cool it down. So I was actually baking that engine and cooking it as I was driving over the Andes. And worse still, when I got to a downward part, I would actually put the car into neutral and coast down the hill because I thought that it was giving the Combi a break. Air-cooled Volkswagens are air-cooled by their engine. The worst thing you can do is stick it into neutral and have low RPMs, low fan speed, and low cooling. What was I thinking? I started making one of the biggest mistakes I made on the trip quite early on, I started to pick up hitchhikers. Even before we had made it to Argentina, I picked up these two Colombian hitchhikers and I continued to do so for the next few years, loading the combi with as many people as I possibly could. Somehow I made it through Argentina and all the way to Bolivia without too many issues. 
which is astonishing really. Till I met another combi identical to Capito and that's when I realized that we weren't quite pulling at the same rate as this other combi. So when we got to Potosi, one of the highest cities in the world in Bolivia, we went to see a mechanic and we got them to do a carburetor adjustment on the engine and that town is about 13,400 feet in elevation. So I didn't really know what he did at the time but I have deduced later on what I think happened. At this particular moment, I think this had a huge impact on the subsequent engine rebuilds which are about to come. I think that he changed the jetting in the carburetor to allow more air in because we were in such a high elevation and there was little oxygen in the air. That is the correct thing to do. However, being a Latino mechanic in a very, very poor country, he didn't have lots of spare parts that he could give me and he couldn't order any spare parts so he just drilled out the existing jets on the carburetor making them larger. Much later on I was looking at what the problem could be blowing so many engines and I looked at the numbers on the jetting and everything corresponded and everything was fine but what I wasn't aware of is I think that he drilled them out to make them bigger to let in more air. The upside of that is that the combi performed great at high elevation, but when we dropped down the Andes, back down to sea level and finally arrived in Lima, things weren't quite running right. Now sucking in too much air into the engine with these adjusted jets, we started to run lean and lean engines run hot. Lesson learned, pay attention to what mechanics are doing with your engine, particularly if you, there is a language barrier and you can't understand them, that is where problems can happen. I compounded the issue by making another fundamental mistake um, and built two huge boxes to put on the roof of the combi. <sighs> At the time I wanted to have more storage and get the surfboard secure on the roof and get some of the things that were inside the bus out onto the roof. However, this allowed me to have more people inside the combi and I found it personally difficult to say no to people that I couldn't take them with me. So I ended up taking a lot of extra people on the trip with the two huge boxes on the roof. That was more weight, a lean engine and surprise, surprise, engine rebuild number one was in Peru. Lesson learned, don't overload your vehicle. At the time I was with Brad and Simone, it cost us $30 each to have a mechanic remove our engine and replace what turned out to be a broken piston ring. We thought that was pretty good for under $100. We were on our way. However, three days later, we were in another mechanics doing engine rebuild number two. I should probably add that I suspect that the mechanic took advantage of us and when we weren't looking he swapped our good head for a bad one that he had. I can't remember at this point whether it was either a broken valve or a broken valve seat however our head needed to be removed and reworked and put back on the engine it, then this time it cost us $50 each that's $150 for the work um, we were back on the road pretty much the same day and very grateful for it. Lesson learned, cheap work isn't necessarily good and never tell your mechanic that you're passing through the town because then they have no reason to give you the best parts and do the job properly because they know they're never going to see you again. By the time we got to Ecuador, something was seriously, seriously wrong with our engine. We had to climb from sea level up to Quito where we could find a mechanic Quito, by the way, the capital of Ecuador is at over 9,000 feet in elevation and it's a lot of this going up and down to get there. We did the entire journey in first gear. It took us all day and we pissed off a lot of truck drivers. We spent a week living with the mechanic. He charged us 150 US dollars to rebuild our entire engine. The actual engine rebuild cost, including parts, was closer to $1,000, which again, we split three ways, and that caused a issue between me and my travel companions at the time. They were, at that point, intending to come all the way to Alaska with me. However, that didn't transpire, and they were gone by the following country, which was Colombia. This, incidentally, was the last time I ever split mechanical costs with anybody on the trip. From this point onwards, I didn't feel that it was fair to ask people to chip in for mechanical issues. And there were a lot of issues to come. 
lesson learned sometimes i could be an asshole and i definitely needed to work on that second lesson learned this 13 year old mechanic knew more about my engine than i did that needed to change and i needed to get schooled during that engine rebuild, not all of the parts were new because I was a bit of a tight ass and I was, to be honest with you, a little bit scared that we were going to get ripped off by the mechanic. So I asked him to reuse quite a lot of parts. That may have turned out to be a mistake. By the time we dropped from Quito down into the Amazon jungle, our engine was playing up. Within 80 short miles, we were having issues. The engine was overheating. I personally believe that's because the carburetor was reused on this new engine and the carburetor still had the jetting problem so we were still running lean by the time we got down to the Amazon. By the time I got to Colombia, the head actually spat the spark plug right out. At one point we went to see a mechanic who forced in a truck spark plug which was larger than the head, but it did stay for at least about 20 miles. Yay! The fourth time the engine came out was right then when I was trying to rectify that spark plug issue, I managed to convince a mechanic who didn't know what he was doing that I actually knew what I was doing, even though I didn't and I'd only seen the engine come out. And so together, somehow we managed to fumble the engine out and recut the spark plug, leaving loads of metal inside the chamber. Ugh, that makes me feel horrible, but we did. The engine went back together and I managed to make it all the way to the top of South America with that engine and only four times the engine came out during that time. So that's pretty bad, isn't it? But not as bad as what is coming up in Central America. A lot of this stuff that happened in South America wasn't documented in our series and I wrote about it in a book which is available on our website. I did document what happened in Central America a little bit better in the series, but honestly, there was a lot more to it. Central America was a disaster and it all really went wrong in Panama. I got my combi back off the boat and immediately there were problems. I pulled up at the first stop and I could smell gasoline and the, the petrol was just pouring out of the, the hose pipe all over the hot engine. Luckily, I noticed that problem pretty quickly and there were, I didn't manage to burn the combi down. That happened much later in the story. But immediately after that, I snapped a fan belt and then I snapped another fan belt and then I was stuck in a garage for 10 days. Whoa, hold up there, Ben. You missed an important detail. How did the engine actually blow up? Well, I was in a pretty remote location at this point and nowhere near any help. So I had attempted to make the three minute drive back to the nearest house, but crucially without a fan belt. And on a type one air cooled engine, driving anywhere without a fan belt, especially in the tropical heat, will lead to a blown engine in just a few seconds. So yeah, this engine rebuild was totally my fault. Okay, back to the story. And then I was stuck in a garage for 10 days, just around the Christmas period, learning to rebuild my engine for the first time. It was at this point, engine rebuild number five, that I said, to hell with the mechanics, I have to learn what I'm doing myself. And I almost got it right even despite the fact that I had to get secondhand parts from various mechanics around Panama and bring them back to this place that I was broken down, learning to rebuild my engine under a tree in the rainy season. And even though those parts didn't fit in the engine and I had to sand them by hand to make them fit, I still managed to get that engine together. I can't believe it! It's working! Woo! However, I made one crucial mistake. At the time, I had no idea what that mistake was, and I went to every single mechanic that I passed between Panama and Costa Rica, and none of them could tell me why my engine was overheating. It was really bad. Some old guy with his top off and half drunk is come and fiddled with my motor, and I know for a fact what he's done is wrong. It's against everything that the book say to do, but couldn't really stop him and I'm a bit pissed off that he's messed about with it now. Now I'm stuck here with a motor which is really, really hot and it's about to blow up. 
None of those mechanics could spot the problem, which I believe now on reflection and weighing everything up that what happened was when I adjusted the valves, I confused metric with um, American uh, measurements and I what should have been six thousandths of an inch ended up being um, six thousandths of a millimeter, which meant I basically didn't adjust the valves properly. I didn't allow enough time for the gases to come out of the exhaust or for the petrol to be an air mixture to be put into the cylinders, which basically meant that the engine was working really inefficiently and cooking all the way as I drove that short distance to the next country, Costa Rica. And there it went really, really wrong. The engine has just seized. I don't know what's blown up this time, but it needs to come out again for the sixth time. Lesson learned, I'm an idiot. I actually managed to seize that engine completely going up the hill and it is a horrible feeling hearing your engine going <laughs> just completely stopping when you haven't stalled and your foot's on the gas. Uh, what a nightmare. Six times the engine's been out in the last four months. This time was only 500 kilometers. What happened is I seized the connecting rod to the crankshaft, the bearing pretty much melted. Um, the engine had overheated and although there was oil in the engine, it had got so hot, the oil had basically broken down and it was no longer being able to, to cool the engine efficiently and the engine seized. Genuinely, at this point, I almost swapped the combi for a horse. That would have been a very different adventure, but I didn't do that. I found two secondhand engines, one for $500 and one for $350. I went for the $350 one because it came with a guarantee. It took a while to get that engine tuned up well enough to work, and surprise, surprise, it blew up in less than 10 miles. There is oil everywhere, everywhere. Lesson learned, guarantees are sometimes worthless. For engine rebuild number seven was in the same place as engine rebuild number six and with no other option, I built one good engine out of the two bad ones and with help from the people on the Samba forum, I slowly, over the period of three months whilst living in that Costa Rican garage with a very, very nice family, I learned to build my engine properly. And when I mean properly, I measured everything. I even took the pistons to the local corner shop to weigh them to make sure that they were all the same weight and that the engine was as balanced as I could get it in Costa Rica anyway. Some of my early subscribers sent me a box of parts and manuals so I could learn how to do it properly. And from those parts, I was able to replace the questionable carburetor and throw that one away, thereby getting rid of the problem which had been with me from Bolivia all the way to Costa Rica. Thank you very much, guys. If you're still with us on Combi Life, I really appreciate you. Lesson learned, you can do anything if you have enough time and encouragement and also, I learned a lot about patience at that particular point. I was travel free through much of Nicaragua, El Salvador and Guatemala until the point that I drove down a volcano and couldn't get up the other side in Lago Atitilan. There's no mechanic, there's nobody that can help and I, I have no idea what's wrong. I was there for five days troubleshooting the problem and eventually I found one of the spark plugs was intermittent, i.e. it was sparking but not at the right rate to be able to um, let that cylinder function properly. But that wasn't the only issue. We still had a lot of trouble getting up the mountain and afterwards I found out that the brakes were actually seizing, the front brakes were actually on whilst we were driving partially. And also whilst I was servicing the carburetor and investigating the problem, there was a wire which disabled the choke 
on the carburetor and I think I forgot to put that back on. The result of that was we drove up the mountain with the brakes on and the choke on, um, which obviously is very, very difficult. So no surprise, engine rebuild number eight was at the top of that very, very big hill. Lesson learned, it's hard to drive up a mountain with the brakes and choke on. Getting up the mountain, I burnt the clutch, uh, which meant I had to take the engine out to replace it. When the engine came out, I realized that the head was pulling, so I also had to replace one of the studs which holds the head on. So half the engine came apart. And that was the eighth time that the engine came out. Number nine was not too far away. It was on the other side of the border in Southern Mexico. And by this point, I learned something. Honestly, I did learn something. I learned that it was a good idea to fix your engine when it needs fixing and not when you want to fix it. So having done a compression test before leaving Guatemala, I realized that one of the cylinders was not going to last much longer. So before the engine quit on me, I checked into another mechanics in Tapachula, Mexico and went about fixing that engine. Unfortunately, I found out that the other studs were also pulling, having just fixed it in Guatemala and having had enough of this engine that I dragged all the way from Chile to Mexico, I finally scrapped it. I bought a new low mileage Mexican Beetle engine for 500 US dollars and it was almost perfect, but not quite perfect. There was a small bit of play in the thrust bearing. So I ripped the entire engine apart to make sure that this time it would get us to Alaska. Lesson learned, if a job is worth doing, it is worth doing well. The engine I was using now was a modern 2001 fuel injection system and it worked out great. It had much more power than our previous carb engine of the same size and importantly, it had more oil pressure too. All up, it was five months that I lived in that scrapyard because I decided to fix too many other issues with the combi, but I did finally get rid of those huge boxes. Why I didn't do that earlier? I'm sure that those boxes were a large part of the problem. Generally carrying too much weight in that combi was a big, big issue. Yes, they are very capable vehicles and yes, they're very tough and they can carry quite a bit of weight. But if you overload them beyond the specs of what they were designed to carry, the engine will die quickly. And it is a small displacement at 1600 cc's. It doesn't really have the power to pull you through any of those issues. Lesson learned in Mexico, things take longer than expected. Actually, I learned a lot in that time living in the Mexican garage, a lot about family, culture, um, living with cancer, and what, basically the things that are really important in life, as well as drastically improving my wrenching skills. It would be about a year before that engine had to come out, which was a record for this expedition. It had driven quite a few thousand miles up through Mexico, California and back down into Mexico and by this point I was really trying to keep the weight down by only picking up girls. Just kidding. Tenth time the engine came out was in Baja California and unfortunately for the same reason the head studs were pulling and the head was separating from the case. So my Mexican friends helped me out and put in more case savers on the pulled studs. My friends from Tijuana in the Baja Volks Club assured me that it would make it to Alaska this time, and it did indeed make it to Alaska. We did it! But the transmission failed and I got kicked out of America and our bus burnt down, but that's all in the series. You should definitely go and watch our Alaska series if you haven't seen it. It's well worth a watch. I'll link it up there. Finally, the engine did exhibit the same problem again when we were in Whitehorse in the Yukon, Canada. We once again had to put in case savers to um, stop the head pulling away from the block. So that was the 11th time that I'd seen my pistons. On this one road trip, the repeated issue was because basically the engine was overheating, the metal was fatiguing, and the, the studs could no longer hold in the case, and the, the pressure from the pistons pounding on the heads was pulling the heads away from the case, and the threads were just ripping out because the metal was fatigued. At least that is my theory. What do you think? 
All up, that engine ended up doing more miles than all of the others combined. We drove all the way through Mexico, the US, Canada, and up to the Arctic, all around Alaska, and then we drove all the way back down to the bottom of Baja, California, and again back up to Canada before giving away Capito to one of our subscribers, as we always promised that we would do. Now, obviously, that's more problems than I was hoping that we would have had on that road trip, but it was an adventure, I learned a lot from it, and I have no regrets because it wouldn't have been the same experience had everything gone smoothly. That said, we are now preparing to drive across the world, so what have I learned from that first expedition? Well, I've learned that combis are actually a very capable vehicle, and I've learned that as it's a classic vehicle, it does require a lot of maintenance. And if you do that maintenance at the right time, when it's supposed to be done, then you won't have to deal with as many breakdowns and things failing on you on the road. It will happen anyway, because it's an old vehicle and the quality of parts is not there for you to be able to just get new stuff made by the manufacturer. But there is you have a much better chance if you actually do the maintenance which i wasn't doing in the early part of the trip and it's why i was having so many issues this past year i've been building a new combi to drive around the world with my partner leah and that is partly the reason why i haven't been uploading many videos on our channel because we've been working really hard on building our new combi i'm very excited to share with you the progress season one is already out so if you want to see how we got the combi from the desert and drove it across america and the first installment of the trip um, go check that out i highly recommend it and if you're into engines um, and you want to see how we built the engine that we will be driving around the world that is an awesome video too so go check that one out as well otherwise guys thank you so much for watching and your your encouragement and support. I will catch you in the next one. Happy travels.